殺さなきゃならねえと思ったこの手で巨人どもを皆殺しにしなきゃならねえってそう思ったんだ Attack on Titan sells itself in just one minute. In December of 2012, just months after Wit Studio first opened its doors, they announced Project Attack, and a week later, the full title. Attack on Titan. And they did it with a fully animated trailer. In this way, Wit Studio was taking an animation first approach, introducing the shows and the studio's capabilities at the same time. The show itself started in 2013, and after a four year gap, returned for its second season in 2017, a third season in 2018 and 19, and finally, it was handed off to Studio Mapper for the finale. It's a show that defines the decade, introduced many people to anime for the first time, and impressed a whole lot of people with its incredible animation. Hello and welcome to the Canopy Effect. This is an animator spotlight on eight years of Attack on Titan. Let's travel back to 2013. That year, I got a message from a friend of mine. I didn't even know they watched anime, but they were telling me I had to check out Attack on Titan. Articles were calling it the Game of Thrones of anime, and it was being regarded as a huge, bombastic, Hollywood esque spectacle that you just couldn't miss. All according to plan. At Production IG, they separate all their sub studios into what are called sections, a reference to Ghost in the Shell. Section 6, in particular, produced many of the studio's standout works, like Kimi ni Tadoke, Psychopaths, and most notably in this case, Guilty Crown. That was a show that they did a lot of research for, and when I say research, I'm talking market research. It was designed to be popular. They brought on director Tetsuro Araki, someone skilled at making shows that feel larger than life, and assembled some of the best animators they'd worked with in the past. And it was. fine. It sold a decent amount of Blu rays, but this was around the time where success had more prerequisites, and Guilty Crown just didn't end up having much cultural impact. So they decided that they needed to go bigger, bigger than they could even handle at Production IG. There was a whole process of approvals to getting a show greenlit at IG, and some projects just ended up falling in their lap. Starting a new studio would clear them to pursue their own uninterrupted vision. And so, section head George Wada and animation producer Tetsuya Nakataka. Approached the president to tell them of their intentions. And not only did he support them in their pursuit of making stellar works, but made it a subsidiary of IG Port, supporting their projects all with the promise of total creative freedom. It was a deal impossible to turn down. A lot of studios get set up, but then they have to do contract work for years before they can fund their own stuff. The new Wit Studio had a massive head start. And so that's where we end up. In 2013, with a show that was greenlit for two important reasons a compelling story and action that the studio heads felt would make for great animation. The idea was that Wit Studio needed to debut big. That was the point of that original trailer. And around the same time, they also announced the romantic sci fi film HAL. This was because they didn't want to be typecast. They never wanted to be known as the Attack on Titan studio, but rather just a one season thing to show off that they could create anime of any genre. Of course, it didn't quite turn out that way. Attack on Titan was meant to be a level up from Guilty Crown, and it kinda was. Season 1 debuted stellar action animation with the 3D maneuver gear, delivered through a tight combination of 2D and 3D animation. But early on, this was originally going to be a fully 3D sequence. Series 3D director Shuhei Yabata came in one day with a 3D animated demo he'd made that impressed the animators, but director Tetsuro Araki wanted the best of both worlds instead, opting to blend together. Together the dimensions. This gave birth to an interesting production workflow that would have the 2D and 3D animators working closely together. 
the 2D animators would draw out the initial rough animation to basically say this is what we want it to look like. And from there, the 3D staff will construct the scene and have a virtual camera blitzing through it, where the animator will then come back to draw in the final animation that fits perfectly within these digital environments. This meant that they could combine the skills of the incredible animators they brought on with Yavata's 3D direction. In particular, it was Arafu Miyamai, Yasuyuki Ibarra and Yuko Serra, the show's action directors, that were able to capture that Hollywood-esque feeling I mentioned earlier. Imai was up first, having animated that thrilling shot from the trailer, and in doing so, inspired the other animators to have a go at creating one-shot action. And so this triggered a whole bunch of ambitious shots, like episode 11 where Yasuyuki Ibarra helps create this 17 second long sequence where Eren and Mikasa swing through the city. And episode 21 where much like the characters themselves, the animators were each taking a turn at finding the coolest way of taking this titan down. Their roles as action animation directors changed over time, but in season 1, it was all about spending their time animating, crafting the show's best sequences, constantly inspiring and one-upping each other. The 3D maneuver gear is more akin to Spider-Man than any kind of anime action, so when one animator had a great idea, they all took notes. In this way, the fights continue to build and build upon each other until they reach a finale, where each of the three action directors finish the fight in the most explosive way possible. I usually like to highlight my favourite parts of a show in these videos, but the appeal of Attack on Titan is that every bit of action is larger than life, never letting up for a second. It's really no wonder the show became as popular as it did. Whoa. The action directors were the stars of the first season, but even they defer to the talents of series director Tessera Araki. Araki is a difficult person to overlook in the production of Titan because his influence is everywhere. From the very first trailer, as an animator in his own right, he was giving Imai tips on how to draw the action of the manoeuvre gear. And as I said before, it was his idea to have the action be a 2D 3D hybrid instead of fully 3D action scenes. Even when he's not credited, he's always missing making sure to explain his vision both through detailed instructions and plenty of drawings. It was him who invited Imai and Ibarra to be action directors in the first place. But while he understood the importance of good action, what is action if not for great character art? And so it came down to a contest where artists would submit their ideas for the character designs of the show. In the end, it was Guilty Crown's main animator, Kyoji Arsenal, that came out on top with his reinvention of the manga art with thick, distinctive outlines and a huge amount of expressions for the animators to work from, including a whopping 15 angles of Eren's face. Araki was impressed and contributed some ideas as well, adding in some of the detail in the shadows. There's less lines overall, meaning it's easier to animate, but it has its own appeal that's entirely separate from the manga and makes each character feel more distinct from each other. Author Hajime Isayama admits himself that he wasn't happy with his art back then, so the designers worked with him to create something different entirely. Asano's work on Attack on Titan is incredibly important. Not only does it define the aesthetic, but in some ways, it makes up for its shortcomings as well. Attack on Titan Season 1, outside of the action scenes, originally didn't move all that much, and it was frequently stuck on still frames. This has been fixed somewhat in the Blu-ray versions, which is the footage used in this video, but even through the TV run, it was Arsenal's art, even when it wasn't at its best, that managed to distract us from the struggles going on behind the scenes. Oh, the team was overworking up until the very last moment, with studio president George Wada taking flights to deliver the episodes to broadcasters because even express delivery would have arrived too late. 
Attack on Titan proved their capabilities as a studio, but it also set a standard for working conditions that they never quite shook off. The series ended up being a hit, something they never really expected. George Wider explained that at the time, the really successful shows were Moe stuff, but 2013 was kind of a time of transition. Online streaming created a massive audience for the show in the West, while those who didn't normally watch anime in Japan started tuning in as well. A surprise hit is a good thing in principle, but a massive pain in the ass in reality. Over the next four years, many things happened, but to much complaints, none of them were the release of Attack on Titan Season 2. Here's the thing, as I mentioned before, Wit Studio never intended on becoming the Attack on Titan studio, so while they greenlit a second season soon after the show finished airing, they didn't actually have any time to make it. When creating the studio, they wanted to show off their range, so they'd already planned Horzuki's Cool Headedness, Rolling Girls, Seraph of the End, and HAL. These were already part of the schedule over the next few years. And so during the four year wait, while Wit Studio spread its wings, the Investors sought every chance to keep the show relevant. This included some recap films and cool OVAs, but it also involved Attack on Titan Junior High, a series produced at Wit's parent company, Production IG. While it doesn't have the epic action of the main series, it's surprisingly well produced with expressive character animation and an opening by Link's Horizon parodying the original. <laughs> There was also the live action films directed by Shin Godzilla's Shinji Higuchi with a new sci-fi twist at the end suggested by Isayama. And let's not forget the game created at Omega Force which saw the action return to full 3D, the first time since Yasuda's original test footage. By 2017, they'd exhausted every possible option, and they were finally able to bring everyone back for a season 2. This time, they were prepared. They only had the time to create 12 episodes, but they'd already prepared for a third season over the next couple years. Tetsuro Araki was returning to direct after creating his original project Carbonari, but now his assistant director had leveled up to co-director, meaning they could share the workload. という the stage was set. In season 2, they weren't just a new studio anymore, but instead had had the time to grow as a team and prepare for what they now knew was a daunting show. And thanks to this gap, they were able to bring most people back. From the animation team to the excellent background artists at Studio Biho and the CG creators that make it all work. Getting the band back together after all that time isn't as easy as it sounds, especially since most of the crew don't actually work for Wit Studio, but are instead either freelancers or work for other companies. It wasn't just them either, there were plenty of new faces as well, largely made up of animators who had seen the show in 2013 and enjoyed it so much that they were eager to contribute to its second season. After this large gap, the team returned with a singular message. We've still got it. Horses are regarded as being infamously difficult to animate, but Takuma Ebisu, the newest action director to the show, made an immediate impact by having the beast titan chuck one into a house, shifting the thick outlines for extra effect. In this season, the role of action director changed somewhat. Instead of just creating a load of animation that would form the inspiration for the rest of the show, this time there was so much action that their focus was instead on revising cuts by the rest of the staff. But of course, this didn't stop their animation arms race, with each of the action directors reading through the manga to call dibs on scenes well before anyone was even thinking about them. Arafumi Amai has said that this was the season where he felt like he'd run out of ideas. But that's the problem with genius animators. They can get a bit too humble. This season was an improvement in a lot of ways. Firstly, there were a lot less stills, with the show's excellent animation not just being reserved for its action set pieces. And these were given an extra oomph thanks to the team's experience on Carbonari of the Iron Fortress. 
During that show, they were working with esteemed original character designer Haruhiko Mikimoto, and so to retain that appeal, they established the new role of makeup animator, where their job is to digitally go over completed shots, adding texture and sheen. And so this same process was used in Attack on Titan's second season as well, enhancing the detail of Kyoji Asano's character designs in close-ups, as well as a few of the Titans as well. The artwork in Attack on Titan has always been a highlight, from the anime designs to the background art created by the newly award-winning Shinichiro Yoshihara at Studio Biho. It's a world that's just nice to look at. Season 2 was perhaps the best Attack on Titan has looked, but they did end up finding some concessions. The action animators had gone above and beyond to keep the Titans in full 2D, which as we now know, is harder than it sounds. These big boys have a ton of detail, and by Season 2 it made more sense to have the Colossal Titan, the most detailed big boy in CG. Shuhei Yabata and his team at Madbox had become renowned for their work on the 3D backgrounds and set pieces of the show. But when it came to the Titan, coming from much of the same team as Overlord's Gormless Goblins, it came out looking kinda lame. They do make the best of it though. In episode 7, storyboarded by ex for Table director Takayuki Hirao, we see the characters spinning around this CG monstrosity in epic one-shots, which would have been almost impossible to achieve in 2D. Likewise, the armoured titan with a similar amount of detail was also a victim of concessions. These guys didn't appear too much in the first season, but season 2 was struggling with having them constantly turn up on screen. In the case of the armoured titan, many of his scenes have him either entirely still, or have his movements feeling somewhat janky. When you animate this big boy, the animator has to draw every individual plate of armour on every single frame. It's kind of a nightmare and it's one of the reasons shows like Berserk end up being in 3D. We do get enough movement for a cool looking Eren vs Armoured Titan fight, although admittedly much of that action was on Eren's athletic martial arts, since the Armoured Titan is consistently animated with less individual drawings or frames than other characters. I mean, look at all of the individual lines on him. There are standout scenes, but even a simple run cycle would have been hard enough to accomplish. <laughs> But detailed big boys weren't the hardest thing the team at WIT Studio were having to deal with. In 2019, WIT Studio president George Wada told Honey's Anime that he expects the staff to spend some amount of nights sleeping overnight at the studio to complete their work. But then he clarifies that the idea is that they'll then get a nice long vacation as a reward after the show's done, so they can spend time with their families. But it's clearly not enough and the team at WIT absolutely know it. The director of Ancient Majesty's Bride described in an interview how he had to whip the Attack on Titan team back to work after they just finished on season 2, and described the atmosphere at the studio as comrades falling down one after another. George Wada followed up by saying that the default lunch at the studio is energy bars, and that they spend all day and all night at their desks. <laughs> It's not like this is uncommon in the anime industry, but it's almost sociopathic to hear someone say it so openly while doing nothing to solve it. But hey, industry icon am I right? When talking about popular shows, we're often under the impression that the animators are doing it for the fans. Wada himself constantly talks about how the animators are fueled by positivity from the Attack on Titan fanbase, but in fact, He's the only one saying this. The thing that got the animators through the production of Attack on Titan seasons 2 and 3 wasn't just about impressing fans, it was about impressing each other. I mentioned before that Arafumi Amai felt like he'd ran out of ideas, so while preparing for season 3, he read through the manga and ended up being enamoured with Levi's upcoming scenes. He's the strongest character, and he was encouraged by Iraqi to consider all of these characters as master athletes. In fact, he was watching footage of NBA basketballer Alan Iverson as a reference for the show. This culminated in season 3's best moments, Levi vs Kenny which took a month to animate, and Levi vs the Beast Titan which took a month to storyboard and 3 months to animate. 
To have the time to do these shots, Imai asked the director if he could start his work early, before the rest of the team had started working on those episodes. His co-action director Takuma Ibisu once complained, stating that he'd stolen all the good bits. But that's not to say that Ibisu didn't get his own times to shine of course. While Season 3 Part 1 was more focused on battles between humans than titans, there wasn't much that changed in terms of production, with most of the team returning from Season 2 the year prior. Although character designer Kyoji Asano did take the opportunity to revise the character designs to closer fit how the characters had aged in the manga. I said before that the fans weren't necessarily their motivation, but the fans did have a role in shaping how these characters looked that they weren't even aware of. Due to Titan's popularity, popularity and the time in between seasons 1 and 2, a load of people had created their own costumes and models based on the show. Of course all their work was based on the anime, but now if the anime creators are wondering how the survey corps outfits would look at certain angles or in certain poses, they can search online and find the exact answers they were looking for. I miss anime conventions. But anyways, as with earlier seasons, season 3 doesn't always have incredible animation. It's Attack on Titan, so of course, there were going to be production issues, especially with the staff being as overworked as they were. So while there are some incredible highs, there were the usual lows. In particular, the fights with the more detailed titans still felt awkward due to the immense amount of detail leading to janky animation and character dialogue that was often still represented through still frames. But this didn't end up actually mattering to most fans. Titan has always had a knack for having the show still look good regardless, thanks to the work of the character designer, background team and artists that have worked on the show for years. Now let's see what happens when all of that goes away. I'll say it again, Wit Studio never wanted to just be the Attack on Titan studio. In fact, Attack on Titan Season 2 was the only sequel TV series they've ever agreed to. When Hozuki's Cool Headedness was greenlit for a sequel, it was handed off to Studio Dean, and more recently, the Ancient Majesty's Bride OVA trilogy are being made at the newly formed Studio Kafka. But even if it took four years, Wit Studio returned for Attack on Titan without messing up their plans to continue making lots of different kinds of shows even if it did end up contributing to overwork. Wit Studio plans well in advance, always having a vision for the next 5-10 to 10 years, and their vision right now, in part thanks to the success of Attack on Titan, is largely in original stories rather than adaptations, creating The Great Pretender in 2020 and both Vampire in the Garden and Vivi Fleuret Ice Song in 2021. And so with these plans ahead, it's no surprise that Wit talked to the rest of the Attack on Titan production committee and decided to give the show away. Production IG would still be funding it as a member of the committee on their behalf, but Wit wouldn't be making it. But now here comes the problem. Who on earth would actually want to finish it? It's not exactly creative work finishing off someone else's show, and the idea was that it would come out soon, not in four years again. And so producers at the publisher Kodansha and TV station MBS wondered, which studio would willingly create a sequel, is large enough to create shows to a tight deadline, and wouldn't mind overworking the team with an overly complex show. Attack on Titan the final season would be created at Studio Mappa. It's hard not to be cynical about this change when the reasons for the change were cynical to begin with. Other studios were offered the show, but turned it down due to its overly tight schedule. While Wit Studio held a design contest to determine who would create the character designs for the show, Mappa's Tomohiro Kishi was invited into the president's office and just told to do it. And instead of the director forming a super team like in season 1, this was more about who was available, with many of the crew from To the Abandoned Sacred Beast and Dora Hedora taking up the mantle. 
Since the founder left the studio, Mappa has been more about accepting work than developing it themselves. And so, in the same year that director Yuichiro Hayashi had finished working on Dorahedora, he was brought back again to serve as the director for Attack on Titan, a role he never expected to have. But here's the thing, sure, the show kind of just fell in the lap of its creators, but these are still some excellent creators. Like Tetsuro Araki, Yuichiro Hayashi is also a director chosen by by legendary producer Masao Mariyama. He started out at the studio guiding Mappa's new 3D team in Garo the Animation, and he's taken this role to heart, working with them on each of his shows, eventually leading to the impressive Dora Hedora and now Attack on Titan the final season, working alongside Studio V-Sign. The final season doesn't have any star 2D animators. It has a few standout scenes, but nothing that defines the show in the same way that the action directors on the first three seasons did. So instead, the role of defining the show's action set pieces, especially involving the Titans, falls to these 3D artists. And it's genuinely impressive. In season 2, I cringed every time Madbox's colossal Titan appeared on screen, but Final Season's work stands out in a way that few people give it credit for. I didn't watch Final Season on its debut, but instead caught it a few weeks later. And over that time, I'd been inundated with comments about how terrible Attack on Titan CG was. And so when I finally watched the episodes, it was like, wait, this is what you're complaining about? This is the best the Armored Titans looked since episode 2. While they're 3D models, their actions are defined by 2D poses and guides, making sure everything matches the sort of motion we'd see if they were in 2D. This also includes frame skipping, something common throughout 3D anime and Spider-Verse, to give off that very deliberate limited feeling. To top it off, it has that same extraordinary texture work that we saw in Dora Hedora, matching the style of the show, turning what could have been a low light instead into a highlight. It is still far from matching the appeal that we're used to though, and a lot can get lost, especially when it comes to Titan expressions. The additional 2D effects animation does help, but I imagine most were hoping for the full 2D animation that was teased in the pre-animated trailer. But of course, that level of quality would have been a nightmare to keep up with on the tight schedule they've been given. Wit Studio in particular struggled with Titan battles for years, with animators having to spend ages drawing them during the action scenes. Eren looked cool with all his mixed martial arts attacks, but as I mentioned before, the more detailed a Titan is, the less it's going to be able to move. And so the solution was simple. In fact, they'd found the solution back before season 1 had started airing, when Shuhei Yabata first proposed they create the battles in 3D. It's just now, 8 years later, that they're actually doing it. 3D animation in anime is still a sore spot for many people, and 3D producer Yusuke Tanawa admitted that since they were unable to match Wit Studio's work, he was anxious that it wouldn't satisfy the fans. And I mean, he's not wrong. No matter how good a job he did, there would always be naysayers purely due to the circumstances he and his team have been put through. But it really was necessary. But I'm perhaps burying the lead here. The 3D Titans only make up a small part of the actual show, and that's basically where it peaks. Attack on Titans always had a harder time with animating dialogue, preferring to assign their star animators onto the action set pieces. But Final Season's second half is a crawl to the finish, with very little 2D animation at all. Some episodes are carried by their storyboards, but while it makes things passable, it can't make up for the clear lack of movement. And that's because animation is to anime as acting is to film. And while they're able to get away with replicating the 3D maneuver gear shots by creating the faraway characters in 3D, there's no such shortcuts when you're this close to the characters. And so most of these really climactic scenes end up playing out like a PowerPoint. But one of the reasons for the lack of animation is these character designs. I mentioned Kishi was just told to do this job, and it was one he was seriously worried about. He's not Kyoji Arsenal, he couldn't just replicate the look of the show at Wiz Studio. And so to soften the blow, his designs are somewhat of a hybrid between the manga and anime. <laughs> クオリティ
プレッシャーを感じた、感じてます。Kyoji Asano's work on the first two seasons had two significant advantages. It made the characters feel immediately recognizable and distinctive while also requiring less line work. They were easier to animate, and thus they're animated more often. They sometimes went off model, but hell, the show was moving. The one big attempt to get Kishi's designs moving was with episode 2's rotoscoping, and while the process does have the advantage of being a naturalistic form of character animation, the Downsides are obvious. It can come across looking incredibly strange, and in this case, feels like the other characters don't exist within the same world. And once again, it's not like these issues are directly Tomohiro Kishi's fault. He probably could have created something totally unique. But when a show moves to a different studio for a new season, the new character designer frequently will be put in a situation where they end up making the designs look closer to the source material to appease fans. It happened when Log Horizon moved to Studio Dean, and the same was true when Origairu moved to Studio Feel. It is a good thing that Attack on Titan is getting fully adapted, but in today's anime industry where far too many shows are getting made, this is what can happen when that wish gets granted. Yuichiro Hayashi is a talented director, but this was always going to be far from his most creative work. And so, while you do get great techniques like these deep focus close up shots, the manga panels are frequently used as a fallback. In an interview about his work on Kakagurui, he regarded this process as being not remotely interesting, but in this case, He is just finishing off Wit Studios' show, and so in a separate interview, he regarded this as one way to satisfy those fans who are uneasy about the change. And that's kind of what's frustrating about Attack on Titan the final season, and honestly, MAPPA in general? It's the home to some incredible directors and artists, but the company accepts way too much work. The same happened with Grand Blue Fantasy the Animation, where they just continued on from the A1 Pictures show, but without the unique line work that made it special in the first place. Instead of letting Yuichiro Hayashi work on a pitch for a series that he really wants to make, he's constantly having to make whatever he's told to, from one manga adaptation to another. Attack on Titan the final season is a good show, but But it's always going to struggle to make people happy in the same way as the artists are going to struggle to make it. The creators have been put into an anxious position where disappointment is inescapable, no matter how hard they work, and with a schedule this tight, they're having to work seriously hard regardless. Thanks for watching The Canopy Effect. I want to give a massive thanks to Edwin Shale, who bought an Attack on Titan animation book and sent me the screenshots for the Kyoji Asano interview that was sourced in this video. Absolutely appreciated. I'd also like to thank all of the patrons of the channel. I usually upload at least one video a month, but as you can probably tell, this is much longer than normal. So, this is an extra special thank you to all of these people. And in particular, Austin Hardwick, Denimit, Eddie l e h e k e r The aforementioned Edwin Shale, Frizzy Canadian, Frog Kun, Jacob Bosley, JR Pictures, Lou Tao, My Own Mother, Nolan Soga, and Quentin Alkin Smith. This channel exists for videos like these, so if you want more, please consider visiting patreon.com/slash thecanoperefects.